Hello. Happy Thursday. We'll give people a chance to get in here, but uh, hope everybody's had a good week. All right. Yeah, we're slowly getting more people in here. If you have trouble hearing me at various points during the uh, evening, we're currently under a uh, big bunch of rain out there, so we may get some thunder and who knows. But right now everything's kind of cooled down, so we'll see how that goes. So I hope everybody's doing good. If you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll do my best to adjust things. And, uh, yeah. It's good to be back for class. Just recently got through uh, having uh, our Beltane online, and that was awesome. It was really cool to have everybody that showed up for that. And so we're getting back into it. We got a lot of new classes coming up. We've got our next session of Oak Leaves, which is going to be this coming Sunday, May 10th, Mother's Day evening at 7 o'clock. So we've got some stuff going on there, which I'll give you a little bit more information about here later on. And we'll go just another minute or two, then we'll get started. Hope everybody's dry and safe and warm. It's going to be pretty chilly this week. We've got a northeaster that's coming through. And, uh, yeah, it was one the other day we got up to like 90-something, 90 92. And now we've got a couple days which we'll barely get to 51. And it's going to be very windy. So if you're outdoors, you could get blown around pretty bad, like I did yesterday taking out the trash, which that wasn't fun. But I survived it. All right, now we're starting to get a few people in here. All right. Hello, everybody that's just coming in. I hope everybody had a good Beltane in some form or another. Whether you were able to do some kind of ritual for yourself indoors or outdoors, I hope that was the case. Uh, we had a good ritual. We had a good time. It was it was it was sad that we couldn't do it together with people here from the Springfield area, you know, in person. But it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, you've got to take you got to take the situation that we've got going on. Uh, seriously so it's like we did the next best thing and we had a great online ritual and everything and uh, you know we'll, we'll keep on doing what we can as time goes by um, and you know just hopefully we'll get past all of this stuff soon and we can get back to our lives <coughs> excuse me and also what we're gonna do like we always do at the beginning of class myself and you're welcome to join me but I'm going to fix myself a little something to drink tonight we're having Dr. Pepper and Seagram's put a couple shots in there Let's see how much yep gotta monitor that bottle all right 
And then I'll show you something else here in just a minute. Oh, everybody I know is getting their gardens and things going, and I'm just so jealous because I live in an apartment complex where we can't have squat like that. Well, I mean, you could have plants on your balcony, but I live on a balcony that is way too shady to really grow anything. All right, we're really starting to get people in here. All right, I cheers to everybody. And tonight's topic, we're at Jewish School. Lesson number seven, and we're going to talk about the importance of trees to Irish Druidry. But before we do that, what I want to do is like I do every class at the beginning is kind of set the mood and get things, you know, where we're on an even keel and we can just de-stress and kind of get things just leveled out and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a minute, we're going to take some deep breaths, and we're going to chant the all in, and then we'll go ahead and we will start with uh, this tonight's class and the other things that we're going to talk about. So just going to kind of take back, close your eyes, take a couple deep breaths, get yourself acclimated. Uh, May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up tonight. We've got more people coming in as we speak. That is so freaking cool. It's good to have everybody here. Um, it's been busy. Uh, everybody, we've been doing Beltane, and crazy things have been going on with the weather. And where I live, we've been having a lot of construction and stuff. So this is our first class. Um, back after taking a break for a week so I could prepare for Beltane and then the other night we held Beltane and it was wonderful uh, had a lot of people that showed up uh, for that so that was really cool and also in my very happy way um, I had the culmination of something that has been about a year yeah probably just about a year uh, from the beginning until now and uh, some friends had given me some money and said, we'd like to pitch in for some honey and have you make a batch of mead. So I did that. I made a batch of uh, homemade blueberry mead with some uh, blueberry flavor and some honey and some good fil filtered water. And I let that stuff sit in the carboy for about nine months. And about four days ago, I had everything put together and I got up fairly early and went to business and I extracted 26 bottles of mead out of a five gallon carboy. I was very, very happy and with that, this is the result. Some beautiful, which the bottle is very, very cold. So yeah. There we go. Some beautiful, sweaty, ruby red. I mean, this stuff, its it's got a very decent bite to it, but it's still got flavor and sweetness. So with this stuff, we're not opening up. We've, we've drank just a little bit of it. But what we're going to do is we're going to let these set um, for a month or two uh, to start and see how they mellow. And then I probably won't crack any more until... Um, after midsummer and go from there and I think the best it will be is uh, around um, Samhain and yeah that's what I recommend is like once you have a, a, a young wine or a young mead that you've made you know don't guzzle it down and drink it all up in one fell swoop because um, it's got to have time to mellow out and to age a little bit and round some of those rough edges off but this has got a nice taste it's got a little crispiness to it the blueberry is in there. Um, it was a little bit dry, so I had to back sweeten each bottle with about mm, just under a cup of um, 
actual uh, apple uh, apple cider, 100% uh, no uh, additives, preservatives, none of that stuff. And it's just got a little bit of sweet. You can't taste the apple in it at all, but you do get a little bit of a sweet uh, twinge into it to kind of knock off some of the edges. But even then, there's still some things that are a little bit a uh, little bit over pronounced. So I'm just going to let it age and just have have a good time with, with it. And we've got some friends that are going to be coming throughout the week to pick up their bottles that they put in for. And then we're going to have a bunch for rituals. Yay! And then we're still going to have some left over for just trading, which I'm, I've got a friend that's a really good mead maker. And we're going to be trading bottles between the two of us. So that was an endeavor, and for anybody out there that has ever thought about um, going in and you know trying to make mead for themselves, go for it. It's it's it you know getting a batch that is um, stuck every once in a while. You'll have some batches that just will not turn out the way that you want. But on the other side of that, for all the effort and time that you put into it, and you get a good batch of mead out of something, oh. It's better than anything that I've ever gotten at a store. Um, if you really look at it cost-wise and if you do it the right way and get the right kind of honey and, and this and that, it can be cheaper than going and spending, you know, 12 or 13 bucks a bottle for something at a liquor store that you really don't want. So I'm very, very happy and I encourage you guys to uh, uh, go out and, you know, as time goes on through the spring and stuff, Give it a try because it is just beautiful. Um, and, you know, I'm going to do different flavors throughout the rest of the year. Um, make another batch. So that's very, very exciting. All right. Holy cow. We've got just a little over 25 people in here right now. And we'll have more that will filter in over time. Um, we've been talking a lot. We've been going through the series of classes where we've talked about, you know, we started out with who the Druids were. And everything like that and then we moved into uh, discussions about everybody's wanting to know what books and things that you can get to learn about Druidry and this and that and then we moved into talking about the Ovum and then our most recent class we uh, discussed altars and and things like that so we've done a lot of the practice and a little bit about magic and we're gonna get some more into that here in future classes but one of the things that we kind of have to look at is the foundation of Druidic philosophy um, and practice as far as neo-pagan Druidry is concerned is the fact that one of the things that we're known for is trees. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's our calling card. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, when you look at the word and you break it down, Druid... Drew is oak, and id is uh, learned or wise. So we are uh, the oak wise. We are the people that are connected to trees. Um, the uh, when we talked about the elements, um, uh, the Celtic elements, uh, uh, and everything like that in our last class, we talked about the dwia, which, which is uh, in Irish means uh, leaves. So everything to a great degree is uh, tied to the idea of um, trees. Trees are very important. Um, trees build homes. Tre trees give us weapons. Trees, um, they are sacred places where ritual and uh, other things are uh, performed. And so in Irish society specifically, it is very important. Now, speaking of the idea that whenever they say druids are oak wise, we have to look at the idea of the actual physical uh, location of Ireland itself, and we kind of have to look into uh, the species of trees that are uh, relevant and most uh, found on the island itself. And here's the thing surprisingly, on uh, the Irish uh, island itself, there are not a whole lot of um, uh, oak trees. There are on the European continent, and there are a fair number in England, but overall, 
there really aren't. The most predominant, predominant tree in um, uh, Ireland would be the ash, the birch, and the yew. So oaks are there. There are still oaks growing all over Ireland. But as far as a, a majority or a plurality of species, there are much more <clears throat> others that are not oaks. So oaks were kind of special. Oak groves um, were sacred spaces too. Um, very important. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the idea we talked about animism, um, you know, being one part of Druidic, Druidic philosophy of the idea that the animal spirits and things like that are very important. Well, on the other side of that, you have the plant world and that those plant spirits are just as important as the physical animals that inhabit those woods. So when you look at it at a magical and spiritual point, you see that uh, throughout the years that um, the oaks and, and whatnot were very important. Um, as an example, and we'll talk about uh, some of the things that, you know, that Druids were known for back in, in those ancient times uh, dealing with the oaks, but also the idea that um, trees were given status the same way that Celtic culture, people within Celtic culture were given status. There were trees that were considered kingly and there were trees that were considered common and there was a hierarchy, hierarchy of trees in between and uh, it's it's like uh, I say that that druidry is almost kind of close to two things: the Vedic, the Indian Vedic system, because uh, Vedic uh, Vedic ritual and writing is kind of based on a caste system, and so the idea that there are lower and higher castes of trees, as the same way that you have within Celtic society, specifically Irish society, it it kind of shows that. That a that the people and the uh, earth were tied together uh, very much so because if it weren't they wouldn't have given those designations to the various trees and shrubs and things that they thought were important for whatever reason. Um, also, the idea that uh, not just the fact for the things that trees did, you know, like. The tree, well, for one main thing, trees are givers of life. If we didn't have trees on the planet, we wouldn't be here. You know, trees are the lungs of the earth. It's through them that they uh, that they um, scrub out carbon dioxide out of the air and release oxygen. As soon as we stop having that dichotomy, we can't survive because then we become oversaturated with CO2. And we can't live on CO2. We're a beings that need and require oxygen to survive. So the idea of, you know, uh, that trees are life givers. you got to think also of the things like trees make weapons. And you can make uh, spears and various things. And those are useful for hunting. To bring food to the tribe. To bring to food to the clans. To your family. So everything is interconnected. Nobody really thinks about how um, trees provide for us. Everybody just thinks that they are, you know, just something that's out there in the woods and that's all they are. But when you really look at the ancient history of things, um, you know, from, from those people's perspectives, um, you know, it was very important. It, 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 you know, even examples of now, because we know that the modern uses of trees that we have are for like paper and for lumber and things like that but there's also the idea of the other side of it that trees were very important for the idea of, of uh, for life is medicines there were trees that were very medicinal for their for their fruit for their bark um, and just various things and roots and things that were attached to them that were used uh, by the tribes for all things like the idea it's like you would never think that aspirins modern day aspirins are made from birch that is an that is one part of the the equation that goes into making uh, uh, actual aspirin and you know things that take away our headache and stuff like that 
are done by birch trees and so on and so forth so um, and they knew that that's one of the things that I like about pain practice is the idea that you know outside of the way things are now that we have the ability to take and extrapolate from something that grows wherever we find it and being able to study it and kind of figure out what are some of the things that that this that this being can do because another thing is the idea of uh, giving them status whether you're a, a kingly tree or a higher higher status tree to a commoner is the idea that the people were were indeed uh, giving them kind of animus properties uh, animist ideas in the fact so I'm looking at it this way if a human species was giving a, a tree or a species of tree or a group of trees or trees in general the traits that they give to their own society you don't do that if there's not a realization that trees are important um, and also that also gives it to a, a belief that trees are alive and that trees have spirits I believe that trees have spirits they're called dryads tree ants various different things there's various different uh, names that they've been given over time and uh, the, the thing that I think is very cool is in recent years in the last 40 or 50 years there have been people uh, that have been going out into various uh, wooded areas and kind of testing hypothesis about the idea of how trees are alive uh, not just the fact that they grow from sunlight and water and they you know like I said that they that they give us oxygen after you know uh, rec recompensing all of the uh, co2 that's in the world but also that the fact that trees are sentient that they understand their environment that they have means and processes by which um, they speak to each other um, and uh, they can uh, through interconnected root networks and things through various large forests in the world and this has been done there have been tests that have been done in forests in Britain uh, in the Black Forest in Germany and some various other places that trees are not just inanimate objects that are just there for no reason they you know trees serve a purpose and that's why I think another thing is it gives a little bit more credence to the idea of uh, trees as spiritual beings because of the simple fact we have to look at what's going on now as well as what went on then and the thing that saddens me the most is the fact of like you know here in the United States how many are here in this country that are old enough to remember when the Pacific West and in California and the Pacific Northwest and California and stuff ever since the late 40s uh, to the middle 90s we just went through this boom of logging and deforestation and just clearing clear cutting and all of these things and the things that people had to do to go in and protest and stop this stuff because and and what's been going on with the last year with the deforestation and burning of the Amazon rainforest and some of the the forested lands that go further down into South America and in Brazil and various places it's these it's these places here that once they're gone it's going to make it very hard for the rest of the planet to recover from that much of a loss of, of, of tree mass you know uh, not just the fact that they're trying to clear it out so that they can have farmland um, trees are great at stopping erosion and so you're gonna have uh, different you're gonna have catastrophic things I mean we've looked and seen what has happened with the fires here in the United States we've had so many forest fires over the last 40 years um, and what just recently happened in Australia so trees are very very important um, out whether or not people understand that they are something that we can uh, work with spiritually just for what they are on this planet we have to take care of them because you know something down sometime down the line we're gonna hit that critical mass and when we do um, 
it's, it's we're going to hit that tipping point and we're not going to be able to come back for, from it and survive as a species. And that's another thing is I believe, let me get a drink here. That even back then, that the Celts, the Irish, and stuff, that they understood the idea of uh, conservation. Uh, even in Ireland, they didn't go through there just cutting down every tree that was in their path, because they understood that you had to let you had to let things grow certain ways, and you know, so it was like. It was it was understand and then that's how that they based some of their their the, the path itself you know the idea of that we were the people of the oak the oak wise well that went just from not just from the druidic hierarchy not just the the priestly druids but then you look at the ovate seers the ones that were down in the trenches that walked into the forests every day and these were the ones that looked for the the herbs that grew on the tree stumps they look for the various leaves, barks, and things so that they can make tinctures to help with childbirth, um, uh, anticoagulants and stuff. So it's like that magical searching that they went through to go through these various forests and things like that. Um, they were the ones that, uh, you know, were kind of the forerunners to modern medicine. You know, like they say, magic is science, and I believe that. I believe that science is magical. Um, you know, that there is no divorcing one from the other. Um, even now, even now, I believe that. To a degree, it's like, um, especially once you go from here to countries that are less developed, and they are still kind of leaning more towards uh, some of the more homeopathic, uh, natural ways like places in Africa. I mean, there are places in Africa where you can't find a hospital, that you can't go to a doctor, so you're forced to use what's there. You've got roots, berries, trees, all these different plants and things, and so you end up having to 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 uh, improvise and you know work out solutions the best you can because you can't go to a Walgreens or you know some of these other places and just get an order for something that's going to help you with whatever physical thing that you are wanting to have taken care of and I think that's another thing that ties in the idea of the trees to us and it ties the trees to the gods because I believe that the gods are the ones that kind of keep an eye on the planet and by doing that I mean that they I mean we've had some pretty bad situations but you also have to look at it like that as an example with Australia it was bad it was very very bad we can't not say that it wasn't but after all of the loss and all of the animal species that were just devastated by it there are things that are showing that areas that have been hit hard by the fires and stuff are already starting to recover there's new growth. Uh, there are new trees that are even starting to grow. Um, and the, these things that are starting to grow in these other places. Uh, the animals are going to take a while to get back into these spaces. But at least the fact is that they are on the mend. It's going to take another 30, 40 years maybe before Australia as a whole, those places that were burned massively, before they are really back 100%, but that's what the earth does. Sometimes you'll, you'll be in one spot and it's going to be luscious and beautiful, and then you're going to be in another spot where it's harsh, desertous, dry, and you know, that's the thing is also, I believe that uh, the earth is a living organism, and when you're a living organism, you have to take care of yourself. Um, there, there, there are processes that go on that, like a snake shedding its skin, whenever these things go on, I believe that the earth knows where things need to be done the most, and that's on that side of things, but then you have to look at us. We have two types of people. We have smart people, and we have dumb people, and I think over my lifetime and beyond, over the past hundred years or so or whatever 
and, and beyond that, that uh, industrialization, advancement of human species and stuff, uh, we just know it because we've expanded. We've grown so much uh, even since the United States was formed that whenever you have a society that grows from a handful of people to billions of people all across the world, um, there's, there's consequences from that. And one of the consequences is, is that we have destruction going on within our environment. Uh, the greatest example of that over the last 40 years is A, the fires on the West Coast, and B, a lot of that also is the idea of all the floods and um, hurricanes and massive tornadoes and stuff like that that we've been dealing with. And, you know, everybody says, well, that's just a weather phenomenon. But, yeah, that's a weather phenomenon. But we have part, we have part and parcel into that. Everything that we have stripped out, areas that we have made desolate, are places that needed to not be done that way and stuff. So whenever you take away all of these natural spaces and reduce them to just parts of the Earth's crust, it, 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 you know, the job that that area did, like the other sad thing, is like so many places are destroying our wetlands. Our wetlands give cover and homes to so many species of birds, waterfowl, and stuff like that. But also, you got to look at it the other way, is the idea that wetlands are the things that are like sponges that soak up excess water and can help buffer locations from uh, large large scale floods as an example with that was when we had hurricane katrina and uh, uh new orleans and such was devastated and i think one of the things that uh kind of made that so bad is one i just think that the location of where new orleans is um you kind of don't want to build a major city on a floodplain uh, you know, and it's like also over the years through whatever fault of their own um, and and things, they have decimated the wetlands around them. They've gone in and they've torn out. They've torn out whole sections of swamp to make, uh, you know, more areas for homes and things like that. So whenever you take the things that are meant to uh, be buffers and help uh, the environment around you, you can't stop it. I mean, we could not stop the devastation that happened uh, uh, in in New Orleans after the fact because that we had gone in through so many different years and um, had you know just decimated everything. So trees um, and and these wetlands and these swamps and all of these things are interconnected and are very important so the oak getting back to the oak like another example uh, with the oaks in Ireland yes like I said they didn't have very many but on the other side of that that also gave us that classic image which you can find you go to Google images and just type druids in druids druids with sickle or druids with something else there's another one that will take you directly to that image pretty much and that is the idea that you see uh, druids in the forest, uh, in the groves, and they are spreading out a white sheet on the ground with the head druid climbing up on the bough of an oak tree and taking a golden sickle and harvesting a, uh, a, a shock of um, mistletoe. Now, mistletoe is very important for its representation of male and female, the male energy with the red berries and the idea of semen and uh, reproduction with the white berries and things like that, uh, you know, associated with the mistletoe itself. Plus, mistletoe um, has healing properties when used property, properly, and it also has things that can, that are dangerous, that could possibly kill somebody. So you have that, that that balance between you know what part of it that you're going to use but the one thing that people don't really realize I mean yeah it's great that you have mistletoe but what you don't realize a lot of times is people don't think about it is mistletoe is a parasite mistletoe is not something that is just an automatic plant 
Um, there are things that there are times whenever uh, 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 certain trees will be struck by lightning or they will have had um, uh, instances where they were sick and had some kind of a, a fungus or a virus or something that had gone through the integrity of the tree and made it to where that the uh, oaks were able to have mistletoe on them. So mistletoe by itself um, is not, it's, it's, it's a magical thing. We've always used it, you know, kissing under the mistletoe and all that stuff. But you look at it in a, in a physiological way that it comes about, and it is a lot different than we think. It is a parasite. Now, there are special types of trees that are, uh, you know, something that I would love to find, uh, but I'm not going to find them here. You might find them in the United States, but my, my thing would be to look for them in Ireland. And that is the idea that there are um, oak trees that have been struck by lightning and they've been struck young enough that there will be branches that at various times as they grow, they will start to spiral. And they almost look like a spot, the, the, the branch looks like a spiraling uh, unicorn horn. And those are called oak dragons. And sometimes... Uh, the, because of the fact that that tree was struck with that energy and finding that that dragon is, is gr that oak dragon is growing on that branch. There's a lot of times that oak dragons are the host branch for mistletoe. So you've got a tree that's been struck. You've got a branch that is growing in that configuration. And then on some of those branches that are uh, dragons that they have, the, the sprigs of uh, mistletoe on them. So you're getting this like energy typed up on top of energy, typed up on top of energy. So that's why for us, within that instance, um, oaks are so important. Um, and it's like there are 28 principal trees that are important to the Irish. You have the Dur which is D-U-I-R, which is the oak. And then you have call, which is C-O-L-L, -L, which is the hazel. And then you have the cullen, which is holly. And then you have the ibar, which is the yew. And then you have urinus, which is the ash tree. And then you have octrakuk, which is the Scots pine. Um, and then you have the abel, the abel is the apple tree. And this first group is called the Orig Fedo, which means lords of the wood. When I told you before that they were uh, divided into uh, groups just the same way that societies were, were, were uh, delineated that way, that's the way the trees were. So that very first group, those are the lords of the wood. Those are called the Orig Fedo. Then we have the second group which are considered the commoners of the wood. These are the Aethocredo. And the Aethocredo are the fern, which is uh, the alder tree. Then you have the sail, which sail is willow, or also called sally. And then you have the sri, which is the, the, the sri is white thorn or hawthorn. And then you have the carathon, which is uh, rowan or mountain ash. Um, then we have the bay. Bay is birch. And then we have, and also notice that everything that in this is also tied to, um, uh, the, the ogham. Ogham is the tree alphabet, which we'll kind of, uh, go back to that here just a little bit. But you have the bay, which is the birch. And you have the len, which is the elm tree. And then you have the edith. What is spelled I D A T H, and that is the wild cherry. So, so you have uh, that right there, and we gotta let the phone hold up just a second. Yeah, we'll just let that go. Sorry about that, folks. You have reached four one seven three six eight one six zero three. I'm not home, so if you need. Sorry about that. But uh, 
it's still a weekend. But we also have the bay, which is the birch, then the elm, and the wild cherry. And th this is the middle, believe it or not. So you have the higher, which are the lord, the lords of the wood, which is those trees. Then you have this middle section, which are the commoners of the wood. And then the last set is called the Fodlofredo, which are the lower divisions of more of the trees, which are the dragon, which the dragons are the blackthorn. And then you have the trollum, which is elder. And then you have the fieris, which is the spindle tree. And then you have the finchol. The finchol is the white beam. And then you have the cathne. The Cathne Arbutus is a strawberry tree. And then you have the Krithuk, which is the Aspen. And then you have the Kron, the Kron Fir, which is the Juniper. And then you have the most vulnerable group of the, uh, of the trees. And these are called the Bushes of the Wood. And these are the Losa Fredo. And uh, the Losa Fredo are the, the Wraith, which is Bracken. Um, which, if you've ever seen Bracken in real life, it's beautiful. Um, then you have the Wraith Bog, which is Myrtle. Um, then you have the Atant Firs, which is a gorse, gorse tree or the Whir. Then you have the uh, Driss, which is uh, another form of, uh, is a form of Bramble. And then you have the Frosh, which is Heather. Then you have the uh, Gilcock which is the broom tree and then you have the spin which is um uh the uh wild rose bush which everybody likes roses i love roses so you can see right there that you have those uh delineations of the trees also looking at them other than that other than that we also have the idea of what else do we get from trees fire and it is this is where we get the idea of the of the of the bale fire and with the bale fire we get the nine sacred woods that are needed to uh, um, start a fire and let me see here okay there's something that I put up here Well, it's oak, ash, thorn, oak, ash, thorn, willow, yew, birch, and the, the other two, I can't remember. I've got them written down in my book of shadows. But these are the things that you want to have on hand, if you can, to uh, bundle together and have that as the start for your ritual fires which is kind of important. That's one thing I'm a believer in. If you can, whenever you work magic and you do these various things, that you want to be as close to, oh, how do I say, as close to, not, not perfection, but as close to ancient practice as you can, because uh, if um, you just throw a bunch of, like, just old, dead, uh, just any kind of native. Uh, one thing you kind of you can adapt native trees in your area, but you kind of want to look for the ones that match those nine sacred uh, trees. And when you make those bundles, uh, what you're doing is you're imparting your energy into those, so that whenever you go out to circle or you go out into the the nematon or your grove, um, that's where you're going to spark the energy that gets your rituals going. Everything has intent. Even when you're bundling the nine sacred woods to start your need fire, to start your bale fire. And uh, by doing this, I believe that the closer that you stick to these, these, these practices, that the more uh, effective and literal results that you will get from ritual, regardless if it's something that you're working by yourself or if you're doing it with other people. Um, uh, you know, it's like uh, the the idea of uh, you know the the trees give us and the trees take us away. That's the other side of things. Is like the issue where we're talking about with fire. Um, that's where I believe that whenever we cut down trees or whenever we take 
even something simple if you're going out looking to make a wand or if you're going out to look for a branch to uh, fashion some kind of a, a, a walking stick or staff or whatever that you're going to use ritually or meditationally or whatever you have to be mindful of all of those things because if you just go out and you expect to just take and take and take without any you know reciprocity then you're not I don't think that the things that you're going to do if that's the kind of attitude that you're going to have are going to be very fruitful so whenever I go out in the woods and we have some beautiful areas even just close to outside of town here we've got some beautiful spaces like the Nematon that we built outside of Bolivar which I'm gonna have to really dig down deep into the the posts that I put on Missouri Druid School and bring up the uh, video that we took of the day that we built that Nematon because I think we got a minute and a half of footage of what it looked like after it was done but it was beautiful and we took the time to clear everything out and what have you and uh, you know working that's another thing trees give you sacred space trees are sacred space but whenever you take and you go deep into a wood and you are there you know you can just look around and you can tell you can feel it you can sense it you can tell that there are you know there are sprites and, and beings and and things that are watching you they're keeping them keeping an eye on you that are wondering what the heck are you doing here what is your purpose and whenever you go in there and you find that space that is important and, and workable for you, whether you're solitary or working with a group, the trees are going to notice. The trees are going to understand what's going on. You know, if you go in there with the right kind of attitude and don't go in there with a chainsaw, just going nuts. Uh, we went in with some hand saws and some other things and we made petition to the area and we said this is where we want to set up this nematon if it be the will of the gods and the spirits of place that this would be our that would be our location then if nothing happens between now and the end of the time that we're doing this then it was meant for us to be here and we worked and we had oh my god I think there was like 10 or 12 of us like six six guys and six girls dragging and moving and tearing things out and throwing stuff down in culverts to get away from the area but once you kind of cleared that out a the area was pretty large that we cleaned out so we had enough space to not only have our nematon circle but off to the side of that we had enough room for like seven or eight big tents and a spot in the middle of that where we could set up a stone uh, little circle thing there to build a fire in and that was fun, but you gotta believe me. It was like we went out there, and it was a forty. It was a sunny forty degree day with a lot of wind. So we're wearing beanie hats and and you know wind breakers, and went down in there, and I got poked with a lot of different things. I almost had my eyes jerked out even with wearing glasses. But by the end of the day, whenever we got it done, just for me, I could tell over the time that we were working that the energy was just. It was crazy. It was incredible. And unfortunately, we don't have that spot anymore. People have moved and some things have happened with the people that own the land. So unfortunately, we don't have that spot. But that was our first Nematon. So, and around here, there are plenty of other spaces that we can look at to possibly, uh, you know, form, uh, find some place that we can do this again. It's just like right now. With the pandemic going on, it's like it's not something that we can do. Um, and one thing that I recommend, um, if you want to learn about trees, one of the things that is a good book to start out with, believe it or not, is a book that uh, was written by an author that I interviewed on uh, Pagan Perspectives. Her name's Ellen Everett Hopman, and the name of the book is Tree Medicine, Tree Magic. And it's got a lot of everything about magical uh, spell work, uh, ogum work, just all these different things, and it's still for sale. You can find it on Amazon and other places, um, and it has a lot of really good information about druidic style uh, information that we need 
for working with the trees and such. Another one that isn't necessarily tied to Druidic practice, but I still think has a lot of really good tree lore and information that we can use is um, Scott Cunningham's Magical Book of Herbal Magic, the Book of Magical Herbalism, um, and it's a little book about so big, and uh, it's got just so many magical uh, correspondences uh, talking about everything: trees, plants, shrubs, uh, flowers, the whole nine yards. And this is where you start. This is where if you're into druidry and this is what you want your path to be, this is where you're going to make your start. You're going to start looking at the trees that are close to you. You're going to look at the parks. You're going to look at the campgrounds and stuff. And you're going to see, you know, what is native to you. And you're going to figure out how to work with it. Um, just by a, uh, uh, by a series of thumbs up for anybody that's out there. Do you have a favorite tree? What is your favorite tree? Do you work with trees? Do you work with, are you more working with herbs specifically? Or do you get in and do you work tree magic? Have you thought about uh, ways that you can do it? One thing that I would do is everybody says we're tree huggers. Yes, we are. And that should be taken to another degree. And what I mean from that is if you have a tree in your backyard or a tree in your neighborhood or a tree somewhere close by in a camping area, go up and hug it. People may laugh at you, think it's all funny and stuff, but there's a reason for it. And what I want to say is when you go up and hug the tree, hug it and see what kind of feelings you get. What do you think? There, different trees give off different energy. Different people give off different energy. And the things that I think that's so cool about that is whenever you go and hug a tree, you can feel it just sitting up against the tree after you've hugged it because the energy will seep in through your body and through your back and everything like that. And sometimes some of the best times you'll ever have is on a nice spring day, spread a blanket out on the ground, sit back against a tree and read one of your druidic books or read a fantasy novel or read something that you enjoy and see how that tree helps you enjoy the book if it's a book that you're studying something then how that tree helps you to understand what it is that you're studying and you'll be surprised try that as an experiment go to a tree read study do your thing and then go and do the same thing in your home you know just in your your regular space at home and see what the difference is and then when you do that Maybe take uh, your book Shadows or Grimoire or whatever and take a minute to write down notes of what you think. Um, and then try different trees. If you have willow trees, birch trees, um, different trees of uh, different species around your neighborhood or around your property, do the same thing with them and see what you get. Another thing is uh, connecting with the trees. They want to connect with us. So one thing that you can do is like sit out on your back deck if you have one with a cup of coffee or whatever. Just an early morning one day as the sun rises and just see yourself looking at the trees that are around you and pick out one that, you know, comes to your eye the best and sit there and just have a conversation with it. Uh, tell it good morning. Uh, sit there and enjoy your coffee and just kind of meditate on how that tree makes you feel and what you're gonna have happen is and I've done this before with various uh, plants and trees and this really beautiful rose bush that I had once at a house that I lived in is things did kind of connect there are spit like we talk about our spirit guides there are spirit guides I believe that are within trees and in critters and in other places it's not just that they just don't come from the ether always to tell us things that they're outside, that the earth is out there for us to communicate with. And that does the same with the trees. Another thing is uh, for uh, your altar. One thing that I recommend is if you have some beautiful trees that have dropped branches and you can find a small one that's, you know, a uh, different color or has some kind of moss growing on it or whatever and you like it, 
snip it down a little bit. Thank the tree for um, uh, allowing you to uh, take it, bring it inside, and stick it on your altar. Another thing is that you can take, and I don't know if you've ever seen those press books, and you take it and you press uh, hot, uh, like a wax paper on it, and you can put, you know, flowers and stuff like that. Well, you can do the same thing with leaves and take the leaves from trees at various times during year, whether it's spring all the way up to whenever the trees are dropping their leaves in the fall. And you can see the progression of that tree's life cycle. And then the other thing that I think is very cool, within the order of the standing oak, the, the uh, order that, uh, that you know I formed in 2000, we take it to the next level. For us, within our initiatory uh, tradition, we call them rings. And whenever you are wanting to move forward in your studies, whether you're wanting to be a bard or a druid or an ovate, once you come out of that dedica dedicational period, you move into one of the rings. We have the ring of the oak, we have the ring of the birch, and we have the ring of the yew. And those are uh, based on the concentric rings that you see of the life cycle of a tree. When you cut a tree down, and it's laying on its side, and you look there, you look at all those rings, and if you count those rings, you'll know exactly how old that tree is. And there are people, arborists and, 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 and botanists and things, that that's their job. They study these trees. They study the rings of these trees, and they go, oh, it had a disease this year, or oh, this one this year, it was overly wet, and it had too much water. So like the rings of the tree, that's our developmental life cycle within Druidic practice. There are, and this is not something new, there are many different Druidic orders that have that kind of a uh, advancement system for once people uh, come into their tradition and work with that. But that just shows that the tie to the, the trees is strong. Um, where when I move out of this apartment complex, which I'm hoping is going to be very soon by the end of the summer, um, I'm wanting to move into a house that has trees in the backyard so that we can have a, a sacred space where we can work ritual. And uh, I just need it. Here, the sad thing is in this block where I live, they've cut down a bunch of trees. So whenever you walk outside and you're going down the place, it's very stark. It doesn't look right. The city got all bitchy and cut the trees down. So you're out there and you're going, wow, it's not blocking the sun. It's not blocking the wind. You can get knocked all over the place. Uh, it just it doesn't seem right. So I want to move to a place here in town that has the opportunity to have trees in it because I think that they're very important. And I hope that that's, that's the same case for you. Um, also, if you own your own property and you don't have very many trees and you have kids, perfect way to teach the kids about druidry and about your beliefs and things like that and pagan practice as well is that you can go to uh, 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 the Arbor Day Foundation or other places that are uh, doing tree planting programs and say, hey, I've got a little bit of space on my property and I'd like X amount of trees and make a donation and then come home and take your children out there and make it a family event. Uh, uh, make it a little bit of a ritual uh, with the children. Let them put the plants in, have them help put the dirt back in, fill it up, put water in and stuff like that because I'm a believer I don't know about you but I believe that spiritual practice should be hands-on we should be able to willing to get our hands dirty to do the things that we're doing okay so that's you know all of that side and then you look at the other opposite deal of it is like I've talked about uh, earlier on is the fact that we have so much of our tree species that are being cut down, that are being burnt. And this is the one thing that gets people pissed off, which I, even within Druidry, which I've talked to some people that it just doesn't make sense. Whenever you say, okay, well, we have this side where we're doing all this ritual, 
and we're wearing the robes and we're doing this, but are we willing to protect the earth? That's our job. Pagans, I believe, one of our first ideas that we are, that we, who we are, is we're not just people that wear robes and dance around in a circle and then get drunk after a ritual and do all these different things. We are the protectors of the earth. And right now in modern times, especially with the pandemic and some of this other stuff, once whatever we have is gone, it's gone. And then once that's gone, we're gone. So the idea of druids as environmentalists is very important. Um, getting in with uh, uh, organizations such as Arbor Day Foundation and any places, Earth First and some of these places that are about reforestation. Uh, uh, the, the movement that's been going on uh, the last couple of years, there have been movements to plant 20 billion trees. And there's places that are doing it. China has taken, um, uh, I think, like some of their military forces. And in the last five years, they have planted 60 million trees. There are other places that have planted uh, close, you know, other facsimile amounts, you know, low on the lower scale, a couple million here and there. Uh, there is an effort here in the United States to buy, I think, 2025 or something like that, to uh, uh, plant 25 million trees. And after all of the fires and stuff that we've had in California, Oregon, uh, northern uh, uh, Washington State, and things like that, I think it's fr freaking great. There's places around here, uh, and, and I'm directly smack dab in the middle of the country here in the Midwest, but even here in the Midwest, the Farm Belt and things like that, there are places that have been devastated by floods and things like that. And one of the first things that you that you lose is trees because trees are the things that are erosion fighters. So if you live in the Midwest like me, and I think that would be a good thing. If you have your own property, plant trees. If you know places in your county that may need to be reforested, get a hold of your county extension service, which one of my things that I wanted to do, but it's very hard for one thing. You have to go through a lot of school in here. It's kind of hard to get into it, but I wanted to work for the wildlife management and the conservation department. But you have to go like through six years of school for various things and stuff. So I'm thinking I may, you know, try to be a road scholar in that or whatever. But the thing that I wanted to do is twofold. A, help with reforestation. And then not only in the tree aspect, but we also have the idea of reclamation of, of uh, meadow areas. Um, Kansas and Missouri and Oklahoma and to an extent, Nebraska have some of the largest areas of prairie and meadow compared to other places around the United States. And there is a national park that's maybe 25 minutes outside of town here that they have a, I'd say, 80-acre meadow that they recently, within the last 25 years, been uh, reclaiming. They've gone in. They put a fence around it so that nobody can go in and take any of the flowers out. And if you've ever seen the opening to Little House on the Prairie, when they're running down the hill and there's, you see that meadow and there's all the different kinds of flowers and trees that are in it, this is the same situation. There, And they said that we've studied this area that we put together for reclamation and not just the, the, the flower and tree species that are in it, but insect and animal species that are using it in just this 80 to 90 acre spot they figure that there's at least a hundred different animal species and uh even more than that uh as far as insects and things like that that populate it and so it's like that's very important um i think that uh the idea of you know, we get into this thing of everybody mows their grass. I think that we should reclaim our yards and use them for growing food because we're going to start to need to do that with this situation going on. And also reclaiming it so that we can attract 
the, the animal species that we need so that these ecosystems can survive. Another thing that trees and the plants and stuff are very important for, I don't know if you guys know it, but we are losing scores and scores and scores of bees. We're losing bees to people that are uh, maliciously spraying the wrong kinds of insecticides on f uh, farm fields and, and wooded areas to the point that we don't have as many bees as we used to. And what people don't realize is our food supply that keeps us alive is very dependent on on bee species. You know, the kinds that will pollinate our food, the kinds that make honey, um, that the there are bees that have all kinds of, of aspects to them. Um, well, then we have trees that are important that people are uh, trying to, you know, cut down more, like birch trees, like I said at the beginning. Birch trees are what we use to make aspirin. So any of these medicinal trees, we've got to protect those. And that's why I say we have to be a little bit more mindful of, you know, instead of just playing the pagan thing where we dance around a fire, we should be really to, willing to get out from behind the fire and get out there on the front lines and help protect the species, protect the trees, because then when we're doing that, I believe that when we do that, as we go back to ritual, and as we go back to honoring the gods and various things, it shows that we're willing to work for it. That I don't believe that spirituality should be handed to people. I believe that spirituality, you work for it. If you're going to honor God, you 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 pray to that God. You work magic for that for that God. You do these things. You just don't sit there with your hands out and go, okay, hook me up. You have to be willing to do that exchange. Give part of your energy to get that energy back. And that's the same way with the trees. The trees won't shelter us. The trees won't give us fruit. The trees won't give animals homes unless we protect them. If we let anybody just come in with a chainsaw and cut them down, then we don't get the fruit. The animals don't get the homes that they need. And after a while, we have a desolate, dying planet. And I don't want that. That's why I believe that druids are the protectors of the people and the world. So remember the ideas of working with uh, the, the trees magically, working with the trees literally. And um, yeah, so, and this is just a start. There are so many books. Um, what I would do is, uh, for those of you that are interested, go to Google. And in the search line, type in tree magic, just simple, and then go into the images. And I bet you, you're going to probably find at least 10 to 15 different books from different authors that uh, once you kind of hone it in, will be stuff that will be uh, important to you for, for working your path because everybody's different. And like I say before is... Um, you know, these classes and stuff, they're not going to be overly exhaustive, but they're just things, ideas to put into your head to give you an idea of why we as spiritual people do these things. Holy cow, we've got almost 200 people here. I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me tonight for class. And we're going to be doing more classes. So this first, first seven classes, we pretty much dealt with you know, getting things set up for people that are new to Druidry and are trying to figure out the path that they want to get on. We're going to start dealing with that here in uh, uh, the, not this next class, but one of the, the classes after it. Because we got one more thing that we need to deal with before we start getting into the deeper topics. So, next week's class, we're going to deal with Celtic cosmology and sacred Ireland. We're going to take Ireland itself and we're going to break it down into its component parts and we're going to talk about why Ireland itself is important in Druidic practice. And then we're going to look at, as Druids, the cosmology of our planet and of our universe and of other universes and see how they interact with us as practitioners of magic 
and of the gods and things like that because that's one of the last things that you kind of need to look at before you start moving on into these other parts so we're going to look at the five-fifths of Ireland we're going to look at the uh, uh, Ternanog and which is the land of the dead uh, we're going to look at Hybrasil which is the Irish version of Avalon we're going to be looking at all of these things because this is the next part that will kind of give you a basis, a foundation of getting started on your druidic path. And then after that, we're going to look at the aspects. The next class after that, we'll look at aspects of bard uh, aspects, aspects of the bardic craft, which is philodect. And then we will look at aspects of uh, the ovate seers, uh, Irish herbalism and uh, herbal spells and, and herbal magic and then we'll look at aspects of druid ritual practice we're going to look at and decipher and break down elements of various traditions and various ritual practices that we have put together in the modern era and then we're going to look at ritual practices that were from the ancient times that we have adapted now but how they have come forward and given those within the the druidic aspects those that are the ritual leaders and stuff why it's like like i said you know i've told people the difference in the reason why wicca is one way compared to why druidry is another way is because they're they have similarities we're pagan we do these different things but whenever you chop it down the middle Wicca has different things that it focus on that it it focuses on, and then you have Druidry, which focuses on different things. And excuse me, whenever you focus on these different things, it causes your ritual and your spell work and your magic and your focuses in various things to be different. So we're going to be talking about that. Uh, I want to thank everybody that's here. Uh, uh, if you heard me okay, and if you enjoyed class, give me a thumbs up. Send me some little things, shoot up, so I know that you enjoyed it tonight. And um, what I'm going to do here in just a few minutes, after we get finished here, I'm going to take and process this video, and I'm going to put it up on YouTube so that you guys can uh, check it out, watch it again, learn, uh, you know, have it, you know, available. And if you would like, I recommend that you check out the last six classes. And you can do that by going to YouTube, uh, A Pagan Perspective. That's the channel name. And we've got everything there, uh, you know, pretty much laid out. I've got uh, video. I've got interviews, my interview with Dr. Raymond Buckland. I've got my interview with the uh, ADF uh, uh, author, Kasur Saras. I've got a video that I did on rituals and why we do them. Um, we've got uh, a Samhain video with the hymn to the Morgan. Um, we've got music videos. We've got all kinds of things that I put on there for uh, the penguins. We've got deals to dealing with tarot. We have our Ogham reading night and stuff like that. So there's a whole lot of stuff. So I recommend to check out the channel, comment, subscribe. Also, if you're out there and you're not a part of things, uh, also, I invite you to come join us here on Facebook, and that's going to Missouri Druid School, and just put in a, a request to join the group, and I'll get you in there as quick as I can, and we've got some wonderful folks in there. Um, also, I'm going to be working on a actual podcast. I'm going to be returning to my blog which is a pagan perspective at blogger.com, which I can put the links to that, uh, those things here. Um, and also with uh, the the uh, uh, pandemic and things going on, I have I'm ordained within the state of Missouri and I'm ordained to the ULC ULC Church. So for those that might be having um, uh, a hard time getting to this, I do have a little bit of a background in uh, pagan pastoral counseling. Um, also, for those that are inquisitive and want a little bit more knowledge about things, I can help you with ritual design, uh, learning about things for di divination. We can do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So you can message me here on Facebook, friend me, and I'll 
help you guys the best I can. That's what my my thing is, is to be of service to the people that are here that are checking out this broadcast and and have checked out my uh, shows on Blog Talk Radio and so on and so forth. It's service. It's what it's about. It's not just about being a priest doing a thing. It's about moving forward so that pagan people, druidic people, can have confidence in working their path and also working together, which I think is very, very important. Also, we are going to be having our second installment of Oak Leaf Druidic Discussions. The first one was Killer, which you'll have to check that out. That is on um, YouTube as well. But this Sunday, May 10th, Mother's Day at 7 p.m., we are going to be having a Druidic discussion where we're talking about modern Druidry, ancient wisdom. We're going to talk about how we as modern Druids, Neo-Druids, how we are utilizing and manifesting the ancient wisdom that we're bringing up from Britain, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, the entirety of that whole thing that makes us Druids and how it works for us within our own within within our own world within our own niche not how we compare to to wicca or other traditions but how it works for us so we're going to be talking about that so that's going to be at 7 p.m. central time here we'll have this up again and we'll go there but uh i just want to thank you guys for hanging out tonight um the weather has been very very just crazy uh, we've got a Polar Express coming through, so some of you may be getting snow in the next couple of days, so be very, very careful. Um, just be careful in general. You know, this is a, a crazy, crazy, unsafe world right now, and I just want to bless you, give you the blessings of the gods, that you make it through your next week in one piece, happy, happy healthy, and with your sanity intact. And before we close things up. I'm going to take a little bit of a drink. And we're just going to sit back for a minute. We'll close our eyes. Take a deep breath. And we'll chant the ah win three times. Ah. From the altar to the rings, from the altar to the ring, may the blessings of mind, body, and spirit be yours. May the gods watch over you and your children. And like I say, next week, we're going to be dealing with the sacred Ireland and Celtic cosmology. This Sunday, Mother's Day Eve evening, we're going to be talking about modern Druidry, ancient wisdom. I appreciate you guys very, very much. And if you have any questions, like I say, you can friend me. And I encourage you to join Missouri Druid School. And I will see you guys Sunday night. Thank you all very, very much.